ka tua hau ki te mihi ki a koutou. I ngā mana, i ngā reo, i ngā maunga, i ngā awa awa, i ngā pātaka o ngā taonga tuku iho. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. He uri a hau nō tūhoi, ko Ngāti Rongo te hapū, ko Kuhunui tōku e ngoa whānau, ko mire a hau. So um, today I, I'm going to talk about um, education as the opening of identities. And I'm going to ask a lot of questions. Um, I taught for more than 20 years and I have now been a researcher for longer than those 20 years. And so I'm going to, um, I'm going to tell you a few stories I'm going to uh, ask a number of questions of you and I'm going to leave a challenge out on the table for all of us. So I'm using that notion of education as the opening of identities, which I learnt from a uh, writer called Etienne Wenger in his writings about communities of practice. And I'm, there's the challenge right up there for us all to be thinking about what will our legacy be as educators, as parents, as whānau, as community members. So can I have a show of hands? How many of you are educators of some sort? Okay. Um, leave them up there. If you're also a parent, a grandparent, a brother, a sister of somebody in the education system, Right, a provider to schools. Right, okay, we've probably got two people that this presentation might not apply to, but by the end of it, I hope you two will be thinking about what is your legacy? Because this is about every one of us in here, at a personal level and at a professional level. So there's my educational experience. Robin Kahukiwa has painted this powerful image and when I first saw it, I thought, that is me. I put on the, the white mask, I learned to play the game, I succeeded in education and I hated it. But I walked out with some qualifications that have held me in good stead. So my experience has been the experience of many other Māori and I would suggest Pacifica students and I want to come back to that space. Another painting, this time by a tūhoi artist, Don Ratana. And if we have been educators, if we have been whānau members, if we have seen the look in those eyes, Mason Drury would tell us that that shows that our modi, our inner essence, our inner vitality has been trampled in some way. So that our modi is in a state of modi noho. And the number of boys, including my sons, whose eyes have looked back at me like that. Why I'm showing you those two pictures is when Russell Bishop and I interviewed students in 2001, we asked the schools to share with us groups of engaged Māori students at year nine and 10, and groups of non-engaged students at year nine and 10, we did not define what engaged and non-engaged looked like, but that's what we got. We got groups of students who have left their culture at the school gate, or we had groups of students who were angry, whose modi had been trampled. And we brought, we brought those voices together in a book called Culture Speaks. 2001, we listened to those secondary school students, and just recently, 
I read the most amazing report, and the minister, I think it was, referred to that report this morning. And I've taken some of the direct quotes out of that report from um, NZ Star and the Children's Commission, which actually, when I first read it through, I thought those voices are exactly the same as they were in 2001. But when I reread and I rethought, there is a new voice in there. And that's the voice of the young boy which says, teach kids not to be racist and to call us things like poo and baba black sheep. And I had the privilege to be with a group of, of teachers not long after that report came out. And we'd been talking about it and we'd been looking at it and reading it with this group of teachers. And there were two teachers from the same school. And one teacher said to the other teacher, as teachers do, this wouldn't happen in our school. Look, people don't call this rubbish. And the other teacher looked up at her and said, you know, I thought this was our school. Have you not heard them call And I thought, wow. You see, we've known about this pre-2001, I would suggest. And that voice of our recent immigrants, that voice of our refugee students, is a new discourse, is a new group. And we haven't paid attention to the voices that we heard in 2001 and now we've got a new group of people that education is not working for. And best, we take care of that and we pay attention to it. The other voice I want to point out to you are the Māori students in alternative education settings. Look at that. I'm like a library, quiet and filled with knowledge but they still think I am dumb. Hey, there's nothing dumb about that young man. Yet put your hand up if you would be satisfied if your child, if your tamariki mokupuna was in an alternative education setting. No, I didn't think any of us would want our child in that setting. And look at that comment. Look at that theorising. How amazing, how powerful is that metaphor? And so I guess I'm asking two questions, really. I am a firm believer that if we're going to get this right as a nation, then te reo Māori culture and identity is essential. But at the same time, We've got this other discourse happening in our schools and it's a discourse around, is it about bias or actually is it about racism? And I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about that and I'm going to leave that up to you to answer that question. Is it bias? Is it racism? Now, I'm, I'm sorry if you're a fan of... Is it the Crusaders from here? I, I know lots of things, but there's a few things I don't know anything about. So I apologise if you're a Crusaders fan. Um, but blame my, uh, blame my partner, blame her kuro, because he's, he's from Tainui. There's my, um, my eldest granddaughter, actually. She's a little bit bigger than that and a lot a bit older. And I want to tell you a story about when I first heard it coming back through my mokopuna's lens. The very first time was from an early childhood centre. And basically she came back and she said, Nanny, she's looking like this, and she said, the kids, is, the kids at daycare said, I can't go to Kohangareo. And she's looking at her arms and I'm saying, why can't you go to Kohangareo? Of course you can go to Kohangareo. No, Nanny, they've said my arms are too white. I can't go. 
you know, out of the mouths of babes. And I thought, okay, that's a one-off, you know, that's a one-off, that's fine. She'd been at school six months. And I don't know if you're a new entrant, though they don't call them new entrant anymore, do you? What, what do you call them? Is it year zero or year one or teaching five and six-year-olds? Okay? She was doing a unit on me and my family. Me and my family. And there was a beautiful picture she brought home. The thing that you need to know is that this mukupuna of mine lived with us every weekend. She'd say goodbye to her parents and take over her room in our house. So in her picture, she had herself. She had her mother. I could see it was her mother. Her mother was hapu at the time, pregnant. And I could see her new sister, she had her father, I could tell her father, he was a bit hairy. And she had the cat, and she had her. Now you know my question, don't you? And she suddenly looked very ashamed. And she said, family is what lives in your house. So again, where do those discourses come from? When do they start? And what makes them intentional or unintentional? Important questions for us to grapple with. So here's another story. There, excuse me, Dr. Berryman. I recently came back on an international flight, four seats in the middle. I was there looking totally ragged, just couldn't wait to get home. There was a Pākehā man, a Pākehā man, a Pākehā man. Get the picture? So the steward, the person in charge, not just the air hostess even, the person in charge comes walking towards us with his clipboard, leans past me and says, excuse me, Dr. Berryman, but is there anything you, welcome back, is there anything more we can do for you? And this man looked at him very surprised and said, no, I'm not, I'm not Dr. Berryman. So he looked at his clipboard and he looked around and then he looked at me and I said, yeah, I'm Dr. Berryman. You see, is it intentional or not? I think that's a really important question because in 2015, when we roamed around New Zealand and talked to almost 200 students year 13 and year 12 about enjoying and achieving education um, success as Māori, what does that mean for you? We heard some amazing stories. Now, Kahikitea came out in 2008. We hadn't got it right by 2012. So it was refreshed until 2017, and we still haven't got it right. I know that because I was with another group of over 70 teachers, and I said, now, Kahikite, what do you think? And they said, what, what, no, is that, is that the tree? No, no, this is a policy document. This is a mandate for us to do things differently. What I wanted to ask the students and what we did was, what does that mean for you? So here's a little one. A young man told us about how he received one year quite a lot of awards at the prize giving. And he walked across the stage five times. And finally, one of his Pākehā peers said, how come? How come you've got all those prizes? Did you cheat or something? You know, is that unintentional? Is it intentional? Is it racism? What can we do about that? Here's the worst one. Because I remember when we heard the story, there was not a dry eye in the whare. Here was a student who had been accepted into university had got a job in the shop down the road 
and was working there. The school was still on, but her exams had finished. She was legitimately able to be at school, uh, sorry, at work. She needed the money. And the story began, finished school already? I don't know you, Marty girls. Ended with pregnancy and the doll. So the thing I think we also have to think about is how do we, how do we, enact that movement, not just in schools, but in society. I mean, schools are pretty powerful places, but we're not that powerful. So the question is, what is your legacy going to be in education? Kia ora koutou. Thank you. So we have time now for 15 minutes of Q&A. Kia ora, Dr. Berriman. Um, my question is around kahikatea, and um, I agree with you. You know, we've had this policy document for a while now, and the same with the Pacific Education Plan. Yes. Um, and I'm just wondering what your thoughts are around what the next step should be. So, I mean, I'm a, I, I'm a teacher, and I work for our kahui call here in East Christchurch. And I've spent a number of years looking at these documents and trying to take the good out of take you know take the the great stuff out of them and, and inject them into our school, and have met resistance and have met um, you know some people have embraced it which is great so there's always ups and downs, but you know I'm I'm in agreement with you we're at this point now where it's been going for quite a while and I'm just wondering what you think the next step should be. Right, that that is a great question. That's that is the question as far as I'm concerned. That policy was meant to finish at the end of last year and of course Kahuiako would take over for all students. The Auditor General uh, reviewed that document over five years and she said in her research it was a policy that was full of promise but schools were given insufficient support to make it happen. So there's the first thing that I would say. With a um, secondary school project that we worked on, Building on Success Care Ke Panaku, we used it as the mandate and said, this is the Māori strategy, this is the Māori policy, and we will help you to implement it. Because I do not believe that schools are implementing it because they know how and they don't want to implement it. I do believe that schools do not know how to implement it. So these students, no, I'll take one step back. The number of teachers that said, if I knew what that looked like, then I'd be in a better position because teachers and schools need to know what that looks like. So the first thing that I would suggest you do is get on our website and look at what the students said. The second thing I think you should do is to actually get some professional development around implementation. I believe there are two theoretical um, positions that you need. One is critical theory that supports social justice because that's what this is about. It's about social justice. The other um, theoretical position I think that you might find useful is kaupapa Māori theory because kaupapa Māori theory is about revitalising things Māori and Māori self-determination. What I've found in my research is when you bring those two things together, you can achieve some pretty impressive things. Kia ora. Um, how can young Māori students take it into their own hands to combat the bias or combat these degrading comments that people say to them and how can we empower ourselves? That, that's another wonderful question. That's the question that my, my granddaughter is asking me now. Um, I would suggest that one of the things, as I've said to her, is don't try and be courageous on your own. Um, be with like-minded students find somebody that you can trust and use the evidence to actually push back against it. 
uh, kia ora, Dr. Berriman. Um, the, the airline steward, did you call him out for his mm. sexism and his racism? Um, no, I didn't. He was a, um, a Samoan. Oh. And he felt so bad. So you didn't need to. When I finally <laughs> said, oh, I think you're looking for me. He just, he was, he just felt so bad. Mm. I, I didn't call him out. Yeah. No, didn't it, need to. It's tricky, isn't it? Because we carry these cloaks with us. These, the, as you As you say, they're, they're often very deep seated. And, Absolutely. And, and it's often related to gender as much as it is. Totally. Uh, being, uh, around racism, isn't it? So. Totally. Yeah. Yes. How do we shift that as, at a societal level? What thoughts do you have there? Well, I do know that there are some things that we can do. But one of the things that I know that we seldom do is new learning comes on the top of everything else. And we have to actually clear the space. We have to clear the space. Um, and from a critical theoretical position, it's called we have to do some unlearning. We have to call it what it is. Okay, so that, that's the first thing. The other thing is, you know, I get invited to talk to people and I apologise, and I'll apologise today, I do not have my magic wand or my fairy dust because having me talk to you doesn't make, make a blind bit of difference, actually. Um, you might go away and, and think about doing things differently, but... Once you get back in the busyness of getting back into the busyness, it flies out the window. And so what I've learned is clear the space and then be prepared for some ongoing unlearning, relearning in an iterative way. And that's a sort of professional development that can change this. But not just with teachers. At the moment, we're working in a blended learning space so I'm working with school leaders, I'm working with teachers, I'm working with board of trustees, I'm working with iwi, I'm working with anyone that wants to come and learn with me. And that's having some ongoing influence, I think, because not only do they learn, but they have to teach somebody else what they're learning. And I think that reinforces some of the... Um, the, some of the change, some of the critical change that needs to happen. But it's a long process and we all have agency in making it happen because it's got to start with us. Yeah. Kia ora and thank you so much for what you've said so far. Um, I, work, I work with Māori learners in, uh, in post-compulsory and do you think that the, when you talk about looking at the voices of the students in the, in the compulsory sector, do you think it is equally relevant in the post-compulsory sector and um, you know they've got th they're at, they've been burnt so they're, we're, we're having to help um, repackage differently and um, do you have any advice on how we might support that? Well I think we got we got the advice here about calling it calling it what it is but doing it a, in a way that respects the mana of the people you know um, that's really, really important. Because if we are about Modi order, then why would we trample on the mana of somebody? So, so we do have to call it what it is. Um, I, I agree that there are many Maori people in, um, at university, at tertiary, who have been trampled. Um, but what I've found myself, because I, I work in that space as well, once they see you as an ally, then suddenly things start to change. Suddenly they see people that it's actually safe to have those conversations with. So call it, be an ally, be there for them and their questions. Kia ora. I had a similar, I'm um, deaf, so yeah, and I had a similar experience with the air hostess on my flight this morning. So it <laughs> still happens all the time. But a lot of what you said applies equally in the deaf and disability disabled world, but we don't have the research or the resources, especially from our perspective. 
and that. And I'm really worried that we are going to miss the, con the wonderful opportunity of the conversation and planning the next 30 years when we don't have a lot of resources that come from our community to, protect, to make sure our voices are in this conversation as well, to eliminate those biases and so on. So I just wonder if you have any suggestions on how we can fast forward perhaps our um, parallel our, um, conversation with your work. Thank you. And I would absolutely agree with you um, about there being the same problems. And that's why we had the priority learners, Māori, Pacifica and students with special needs. Um, I have engaged in some research in that space and in fact, Jill Bevan Brown, myself and a group of other people have developed a book about special education needs for Māori with special... Um, no. Māori with special education needs. Um, there is a chapter in there by Kirsten Smiler, who did her uh, PhD research with the deaf community. So there is some research out there. Um, not a lot, I absolutely agree with you, but make, the use, make use of what's out there to um, push your claims as well. They're so essential. Kia ora. Um, that um, image you showed at the start, that really resonated with me. I've seen that a lot where you put the mask on to go to kura. As educators, as whānau, as wahine tua, how can we stop our students from doing that? As in coming from home and then they put that mask on, to learn, and they, don't get me wrong, they're doing some amazing learning, and they, but you can see that they've left something behind. And I'm speaking from a mother's point of view as well as a kāko. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the debate, isn't it, around our professional selves and our personal selves. And it took me a while to learn from students themselves why we do that. I mean, that was unintentional when I did that. I did it because if I didn't, I got hurt. What I found out is I did it and I got hurt, but less hurt, yep. So for me, that's why it's so important that we all have a part to play, that we all have to call whether we think it's intentional bias, unintentional bias, or racism. We have to engage in that conversation. I can remember 18 years ago, um, Emeritus Professor Christine Sleater um, was in New Zealand working with Russell and I, and she used the word racism. And Russell said, oh, we don't use that word in New Zealand. And actually, back then, we didn't. But we do now. So we're all part of it. The other thing is if we sit on the fence and think it's not about us, then we're actually siding with the majority. So don't think sitting on the fence is going to work either. Yeah. Talo for lover, Dr. Berriman. Thank you very much for what you've shared. And certainly I, along with others, am grateful to be in a room where you are too. We've often read your work and followed it, but not met the person, so I must acknowledge that. Um, I also am really grateful too, in terms of the research and the way in which it informs our policy, and so we have these amazing um, help tools like Haikatea. And so, um, what I was curious about, you mentioned that the Auditor General did a review and her decision was, well, she came back and said, you know, it had insufficient support. It was great idea, great policy, great research it was based on, but it had insufficient support. So my question back is, did she say something about whether that was intentional or not? No, uh, not to my knowledge. It wasn't in any of the reports. If you've never read those reports, they are available online. There are five of them, um, and the last one is a summary of all five. Mm. So it's really worth having a look at it. The first one lays out the foundation for education for Māori in Aotearoa, New Zealand. 
Um, and then she goes out, her researchers go out um, and investigates um, how kahikitia has travelled or not uh, into schools. Mm. So, but, but you see, even that, we weren't even talking bias back then. Mm. In 2008, I think, the last report came out. Right. So we weren't, we weren't using those words. They're mm. words that we're now using because of NZ Stars and the um, Children's Commission report. Right. Because they called it. Yeah. Now we call it. Yeah. It's well, a very important report. Yeah. Why well, I'm also concerned about what happened with that is because I'm concerned also about the Pacifica Plan. And one of the, I'm, I'm a board member at a college and for Māori and Pacifica students together we make up over 50% of the role. So my worry is always, you know, like as a board member or as a parent or as teachers, some of the biggest struggles is working out how do I take this plan and put it into action? What is the how? And so it, depending on who, who listens to who, you know, like we, um, we might, I might as a board member say, well, you know, it'll begin with really small things, like the kids really love having food together, regardless of whether they need it or not, they just charge in here and hundreds of them will gather in the morning. That's how you build a sense of ainga. That's how you build a sense of Fano. So once you're doing really simple, it's, it's just as much about the really simple ways we build relationships across as it is about some of the grander things, you know, about building oh. our buildings better and all the rest of it. But how do people in community, for example, how do parents have more of a voice in how some of those plans get developed and some of that how? So that teachers, it makes sense to teachers, it makes sense to a board, it makes sense to the principal. That's the current struggle I think we're sitting with, uh, certainly as Pacifica parents or board members. Thank you. Um, can I say two things? I'll probably say three, so but I'm trying for two. Um, one thing that I would say is that if we, Tato, it's a Tato response, if we don't get this right, by 2020, I believe, if we don't already have Māori and Pacifica, daughter-in-laws, sister-in-laws, in our families, we will. If we do not get this right now, we will not be talking about somebody over there. They will be part of our family. Now, as wonderful as this woman is, sorry, Lodine, is it? As, as wonderful as she is, she cannot do it on her own. And she needs people to broker, broker those messages. She needs people standing beside her. And Pākehā people can say things that we can't say because we then come across as whakahihi. That's the word. We need you, and actually, you need us. I think that was the two words. Kia ora. Kia ora. Maori ora. Thank you.